Hello. Hello, Amanda. How are you? Hello, Mio. My I goodness, can, it's working. I can see. <laughs> I can see an empty chair with no Mio in it. It's about to be filled. Yay! We did it. <laughs> I'm just trying to get. I'm just trying to get this thing linked up because I have absolutely no idea how it works. Oh, but so, you're on. You're on. I'm on. And despite I all that. You. you can actually what? I can actually hear you. Okay, very good. I'm just going to see how the best arrangement. I have lost you now. Uh, let's see how this is going to work. I don't know why this, as I said, I have no idea how this thing works. So I'm hoping against hope. Can you hear me okay at least that much? Is that correct? Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about the picture. I can hear you and I've got a picture on my side and that'll be recording. So. Okay, I've got you now. I've got you now. Yeah, that's all right. I'm seeing you loud and clear and I'm seeing myself down in the bottom when I go and sit down there. Okay. That should, well, let me see. I had a little bit of a crisis here last night, but I think it's resolved. Uh, no, what happened? No, it's just uh, something's got uh, fused up together and it didn't work very well. Now, does this microphone, this is the best arrangement I could come to with this microphone. So is that okay at, at your end? That's perfect. Yay. Is it? Good. Good. <laughs> Welcome to I'll South just, Africa. Thank you. I was just saying to somebody, excuse me, I have to give a talk in South Africa. They, of course, hung up and wrote me off as an absolute nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome to the land of Tolkien, right? The land of Tolkien, indeed. Yes. Where was he from, Bloemfontein? Yeah. Hey, oh, you can't, you can't see this, but I'm just going to uh, show you something here. Is that J.R. Tolkien? That is he. Wow, that's incredible. Let's see, it's just sitting on that bookcase over there to the left. Wow. Anyway. Well, he's definitely, he was, a guiding, he's definitely a guiding spirit in the Soul Science Seminar out at Adam's Calendar because I tell you, it's been like an epic Lord of the Rings saga. Oh, my God. Is that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been through Mordor and the, te the Mount, Temple of Mount oh, Doom and uh, yes, whatever yes, else. I I know it's unbelievable. <laughs> well, is this? You think will this uh, last through our session? This I mean, I perfect. did this. I did it with Michael Tellinger for. It wasn't my first. It wasn't my. It wasn't my first talk for his conference last year, the year before, whenever it was, because I pre-recorded that and sent it out to him. It was too big. Yes, but and I you think were a keynote this... speaker as well for that conference, and I remember you you opened a, opened it up live. Well, it was live in the sense it was pre-recorded, the but then I gave the last one live over Skype. I think they lost the video at a certain point in it, but uh, but I remember anyway, I... that very well. You were wonderful. No, you're going to go really far. <laughs> going to go really far. Uh, is this Tell me picture? All. Yeah. You look wonderful, and I'm so Thank happy to, to be having this live connection to Rain. Is it Rainier or just beyond that, Tanino? We're in Tanino. We're in the the great metropolis of Tanino. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Is so this is this picture? Yes, it's good. Does the good. picture look level? I mean, yes, it seems to be yes. a little lopsided. No, it's perfect. It's not lop Okay, it's fine. Perfect. So, welcome to the Soul Science Seminar. Thank you so much for cutting out a bit of time for us. Amanda, I'm absolutely delighted and uh, I only wish I could be there with you for what seems like a truly incredible experience. Well, so, I hope, hope to, you have a... We hope to broadcast the seminar to all the ghosts that are sitting there in the mountain, you know, that don't oh, know who they are. They still think they're slaves. How are they going to react to that, do you think? <laughs> You have to tell uh, them the God is, is you know, there's no God in the triad or whatever. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't anyway, know if we're so ready for that. Don't you want to 
tell us um, a little, just give us a little small background about who you are, and then maybe we can just start with a couple of questions. Well, I, I'm living here now in, in Washington in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, as you know, and I moved over here after I retired. I was president of a university in Ireland, just outside on the west side of Dublin. And when my term year, my 10 year term was up, well, it was a few months before it was up, I moved out here, which is horror of horrors now, almost 20 years ago. So I came here to uh, follow up on what I'd learned about the Ramp the, Ramp the School teachings. And that has obviously been my main interest uh, for, for those 20 years. But I've done quite a lot of talking uh, of various kinds, formal and informal, all over the world, including uh, obviously in South Africa as well. So I'm delighted to be back here in contact with you again, even through the generosity of Skype's technology. But uh, I was before I was president of the university. I was a professor of theology for 16 years prior to that. So that's basically my background here. Okay, wonderful. So, um, Michal, I, I know we don't have long, so I'm just going to um, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Sure. And, yeah, absolutely. I'm say you know, um, in terms of of your opinion about how we got into this mess. And, and possible linkings to the Anunnaki. Um, just anything that you want to say about, you know, where where we came from and how did we get to where we are now and where are we going? Right. Oh, that's uh, that's uh, how many years did you say you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, Amanda, that fascinated me a uh, long time ago now was, uh, of course, the work of uh, mainly at that time Zacharias Sitchin and his translations of all the texts from from basically from Sumer or Mesopotamia and that region and it brought out a hugely different understanding of the world as we knew it. Uh, we're all familiar with the views of the world that were advanced by Ptolemy around 50 years after the time of Jesus when you know like any of us who would sit out in the night under a clear sky could perceive that everything was moving around us. The moon was moving across the heavens, so were the stars and the, and the planets, if you can see them. And he pr produced a system of the world, as you know, based on the erroneous uh, assumption that the earth was at the center of everything. And I remember an amusing story, which I have told numerous times, about King Philip II of Spain, just before the time of Copernicus, was having the Copernican or the Ptolemaic system explained to him, which was based on basically circular orbits around the Earth. And then when the planets didn't turn up where, where they were supposed to be, when you went to look at them in a telescope, they had to adjust those circles. So they put smaller circles on the circles to make sure the planets turned up when they, where they should be. And then there were other uh, facts which any amateur astronomer knows, that some of the planets seemed to go backwards in the sky based on this uh, theory. So anyway, there were other cycles added on top of the smaller cycles and more cycles added on top of those. So the whole thing was Byzantine in complexity. And King Philip said at the end of this uh, experience, I wish God had consulted me because I would have suggested a more simple arrangement. And that's exactly <laughs> what Copernicus did. I mean, all of the problems that were there with Ptolemy's system vanished literally overnight when Copernicus brought in a different system, which had a different starting point, a different paradigm. In other words, instead, as you know, of the Earth being at the center, the Sun was placed at the center. So 99.9% .9 of the problems vanished. And I think this is the situation that a lot of people uh, are in today, in at least the Western religions, by those I mean uh, in chronological order, 
and Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, because we have a host of problems. And my, my next DVD uh, coming out probably, I have three new ones recorded, but the next one that will come out in sequence will be the obscenity of suffering in the world, which I think has been one of the greatest problems that humanity has had. And fundamentally, as we don't have long, I'll just uh, come to the point and say, it is impossible to reconcile the beliefs of the Western religions with the facts of the world as they exist today. Look at the Philippines, for example, last week. Look at the huge catastrophic uh, occurrences in Indonesia where a quarter million people died and so forth. You just cannot reconcile the kind of God that is pictured in conventional religion and square it with these happenings. I suppose it's all back to what Epicurus said a long time ago. You, if you believe God is the creator of all that exists, and if you believe that God is all-powerful, and if you believe that God is all-loving, how come these catastrophes exist? You cannot hold those beliefs about God. One of them, at least, has got to go. Either he is not the creator, as the Gnostics believed, or he is not all-loving and does not give a hoot about what happens on this earth, or whatever. But you cannot believe that God is all-loving, all-powerful, and all-knowing while he is the creator, while this is happening. So I think we're in a kind of Ptolemaic understanding of reality vis-a-vis -vis God and ourselves. And all of these problems that are basically insoluble, as I said, they are insoluble because our starting points are wrong. And if our starting points are wrong, our assumptions, our basic assumptions are incorrect, we can never, obviously, by definition, get a right answer. Uh, you know, there, there have been times in my past as, as a professor and whatever, I have had shelves of books, you know, on this particular problem. And having read them all and spent huge sums of money on them, I, I was as wise, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, making little of the efforts of the people who wrote them. But basically, we are all left in much the same position as we were when we began. And the reason is the starting points were wrong. And I could not figure out, you know, years ago, how the starting points could be improved, though I knew, thanks to people, say, like Karl Popper and, and those, that all knowledge advances by making suggestions, which he called uh, propositions, and then we try to falsify those statements, to find holes in them. And when we have found holes in them, then we reformulate our projection again. And I could see that that was one thing that was absolutely not happening in the theological uh, or religious searching. In fact, the opposite was happening. They were saying, no, this is the truth. You have got to either accept this or basically go to hell and burn. And obviously that doesn't help when you're trying to advance knowledge. So in other words, it seemed to me that the, the traditional theology, however wonderful and however magnificent its accomplishments were, that it was basically bogged down. And a new start had to be made. New presuppositions had to be made to get us out of this. And the first light, as I said, that I got, because I couldn't see how <clears throat> we would make those new assumptions, was when I came across Zachariah Sitchin's work a long time ago now and others who were in the same field. And uh, needless to say, where, where you are holding your conference now is absolutely uh, wonderfully um, symbolic in this regard of Adam's calendar. But between these two areas in South Africa and the areas in Mesopotamia, obviously we began to realize that there was a huge civilization present there way beyond any stage in recorded history that we had ever imagined could be possible. I, I remember I was speaking to a very distinguished theologian uh, uh, last week and he just could not get his brain around the fact that I believed that there was a civilization existing on the earth 35,000 years ago, much less 240,000 years ago. That is just not in the box of modern scholarship. But when you begin to look at the plight of our world today, and a, a, a great thought of Carl Sagan's, I think it was, came to me this morning earlier, when he said that extinction is the rule and, uh, and survival is the exception. 
So we are actually living in quite a precarious uh, arrangement here at the moment. And the signs are not good. I mean, we have all these prognostications about the very, very weird behavior of the sun. We have all of these natural disasters like the... Uh, I understand the typhoon in the Philippines has been the strongest ever recorded. And we had the same thing here in the Midwest in the United States uh, a few days ago. So all is not well the way, the way things are going. Now we have the sun that has two south poles instead of a north and a south pole. And nobody is quite sure what that indicates. The only thing that it does indicate is that things are not nearly as solid and sure and as settled as we perhaps believe. So, given the fact that um, extinction is the rule and survival is the exception, I think we, you know, we need to devote a little more of our time to opening our minds to fundamental things. And especially, you know, if, if our particular area and our particular interest, obviously, in this conference is about the origins of the human race. Well, obviously, they, they, from the resources we have, and I think most thinking people will accept that nowadays, which has been a big and very welcome change, most people will feel that a huge part of the account of our origins, you know, is to be laid at the feet of the Anunnaki. Though now there are indications that there were probably up to as many as 15 or 16 other races uh, from outside this earth that were, uh, were involved as well as the Anuna when they, when they came here. And I mean, if we just keep in mind that when the Anuna came here, say 500,000 years ago possibly, that they were refugees themselves. They were the ones that had lost a war in their native homeland and had come here basically as refugees. They had a lot of great technology, but they didn't have a lot of uh, sort of the heavy machinery that they did have later. And you might wonder why they would ever have bothered to engineer a new race that would fundamentally work as slaves for them in their minds. I think there are a lot of very practical reasons why that situation might have come about. But the one thing I think that the Anuna never did uh, realize for a very long time was that when they engineered this body, and when they engineered this body with this split brain that we've heard so much about, I'm talking about that myself uh, around these, these times for a month or so, that they never realized that once you set up a complex structure, that uh, for want of a better word, a spirit or whatever constitutes me and you in our being will come and inhabit that structure. And I, I've just noticed in the last couple of years that in physics, complexity is now being accepted as a basic datum. In other words, one of those things that's accepted and never questioned. Just like uh, you know, the nature of electricity. We think we understand electricity. We think we understand gravity. We don't understand any of those things. We have just put a label that helps us to identify them. But how they actually work? How does gravity work? Well, we have particles called gravitons, etc., etc., etc. But how do they work? We really don't know. We know that they work. We know from Newton's laws that things behave in a certain way. How? We don't really know. So that, that is fundamentally the, the, the thing that we are up against. Whenever there is a complexity, a spirit will inhabit that complexity. Or to put it in another way, which is probably more accurate, everything has spirit in it every single thing that exists but the degree of complexity say compared say to uh, a squirrel compared to a rock obviously the squirrel squirrel has far more complexity in its arrangement so it's able to express the presence of spirit in it in a far more recognizable way to you and me rather than a rock is or to a lesser degree a, a tree is so the Anuna never could understand that a spirit had inhabited the creatures they produced to be slaves. It was 200,000 years later that Ratha Bin confronted them with this for the first time. And things began to change around that time for the better as far as we have sources to tell us so. Things between the crea our creators and our bosses began to improve quite substantially. So, I, I mean, we're equally blind today 
you know, if we produce some of these supercomputers for an analysis today, some of these are now surpassing the ability of the human brain in terms of processing. And even <clears throat> without going to that grand scale of things, you know, is it feasible for us to think that our own desktop computers, which are, of course, incredibly far beyond what they were even 10 years ago, is it feasible that some form of spirit could come in and exist in that machinery? Of course it is. And if we deny that, we're as blind as the Anuna were 400,000 years ago or 255,000 years ago. So what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to have spooks in my machine? No. I'm not saying that, but I, if we understand some basic things about reality, then uh, I think we're basically driven to accept that spirit is present in all things and sustains all things. And the old categories of gods that we had uh, uh, will have to go. Because when we had our masters, uh, in terms of the Inuna in South Africa, uh, in the site where your conference is now especially, in the gold mining sites, which are not all that far removed from there, we looked up to them. Uh, because we had no other reference point, we looked up to them as, for want of a better word, gods. Which, of course, they were to us, but no more than we are now to other creatures in this world. But this imprint, which is very ancient, has left a certain way of thinking uh, embedded in our DNA. And I, years ago, I uh, isolated it as the four great diseases of the mind. They're not in the brain, because it was all the talk about the brain in those years, and the brain is this, and the brain programs that, which is true. But, I mean, it's the mind that is the real center of our focus right now. And of course, if uh, we have all these programs, as I call them in the talks I'm giving at the moment, if we have all these programs that are inaccurate about what kind of being God is and what we should be doing while we are here in relationship to, to that being, where did I come from in the first place and where am I going? We have no uh, adequate answers to those in mainline religion in the West. That's Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. We don't. For example, uh, you, you may mock you know, some of the religious ideas of what awaits us after death, that we go up to a cloud in heaven, which is filled with clouds according to the best uh, depictions of it, and we sit on a harp uh, staring at God for all eternity. It's called the beatific vision. The mere thought of it makes, makes our eyes tired. So obviously we laugh at these conceptions or we laugh at the ideas you know, that the fundamentalists are con constantly harping on us about, uh, you know, that if we don't do this or we do do that, then we're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. And this is supposed to be done by a God who is all loving. Now, how can you understand that a God who is all loving would send someone to burn in hell for all eternity, irrespective of what they have done? And, but an even you know, bigger problem, say, with, with Western Christianity is uh, the way they turned Jesus' message on its head, wh which was to say that he came here to suffer and die for our sins. And he is supposed to be, of course, perfectly sinless and without fault himself. So the bigger question about all, with all of that theory is not so much whether it's correct or not, but what it implies about God who sent him down here to suffer and die for our sins, being completely innocent. So God seems in this point of view to be some type of psychotic, neurotic, vindictive, capricious individual. Who, who, I mean, what kind of parent would ask their own child to suffer torments to appease some insult that had been offered to someone else, uh, offered by someone else to that parent? I mean, this is bizarre, and obviously it's not correct. And when we find out that the mission of Jesus here was something entirely different, then we begin to see the light. But basically, you know, all of the structure of early Christianity that was so bound up with the later Roman Empire and so forth, it tailored a religion to suit its own agenda. But I think Jesus Christ himself would be the most surprised of all 
to look at what has become of his message. Because fundamentally, the message of Jesus Christ, uh, I think, you know, putting it in a nutshell, was to undo the damage that had been inserted into our DNA by our experience with the Anuna all that long time ago. And so has every other enlightened being that has come into the course of human history since that time. We're trying to undo the damage imprinted in us by those people. Anyway, I'm doing all the talking and I know you have a lot of questions, so I'll pause there and give you a chance to respond. Okay, Michal, it's so amazing to hear your your wisdom and there's I know there's so much um you know there's so much to say about this topic, but maybe um we could just because I what I've heard is that the, the Anunnaki were split in terms of their um sort of caring for the earth. So there was um Enki and their half sister Ninhursag. Um, who apparently was also part, very much a part of the genetic um, creating the house of souls with her, her half brother Enki. Yes. And, and then yeah. there was Enlil, who um, you know was was the less kind of the of the two, and then created. <laughs> yes, but <probably> mildly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe you could just um, highlight sort of what happened with the family tree, because it's probably one of the most conflicted family trees I've ever seen in my life. Oh my goodness, yeah, you, you can say that again with a vengeance. I mean, I think I said one time that, for example, a lot of people would ask me uh, what relationship was Jehovah to Ninhurtzag or Mami. Uh, I, was, I was giving a talk about the Proto-Indo-European language the other day and one of the basic words that has survived, of course, is mama, that has survived since since after the last ice age, 17,000 years ago. But uh, it's interesting that her name has survived, because that was another of her names, Nin Hortzag's other name, or Niskal. Her common name was mama, which is what we call our mothers to this day. But um, uh, she was extremely benign towards her creations because she, she was the one that engineered the human race but uh, knowing that they were obviously going to work in the mines nevertheless she was very benign towards them and very concerned uh, with them and their welfare whereas other members of the family were not they had a very much more mechanical view of, of all these people so uh, the, the main culprit of course who didn't actually come into full uh, flow uh, was Jehovah and he didn't start to emerge by all accounts uh, until about 25,000 years ago. Now of course immediately the stumbling block that comes up for people of our time is you mean that the, you know, the human race was engineered about a quarter million years ago and we're now talking about 25,000 years ago and we still have no change of caste. The same individuals are still there still calling the shots and that is correct. I mean that these individuals, not alone were they alive 25,000 years ago, but they're alive and well today. So that is a, a little bit of a mind expander, I call it, a mind-blowing factor to realize that these people had mastered the ability to live on for what uh, to us is absolutely incredibly long periods of time. But when Jehovah did come into action only 25,000 years ago, uh, I have never been able to figure out what relationship he was to Nin Hurtzag because as I started out to say, it seems to me that trying to trace the descent of the and relationships of the various characters in the Anuna play here, it's like trying to trace a piece of spaghetti to its origin in a bowl. It's something that's probably a lot easier. But anyway, Jehovah's Jehovah seems to be either the brother of Ninhurtzag, her nephew, her grand nephew, or her husband. So I don't know it. Anyway, it's in that generation that Jehovah came and of course 25,000 years ago he began to take an unhealthy interest in what we would, we would now call the Hebrew people and the rest is history because the other religions descended from that but it was fundamentally uh, focused on this individual who passed himself off 
That's the creator God coming down, you know, in smoke and not showing his face and appearing in a burning bush and all that. Obviously an individual with very sophisticated technology, but obviously also an individual who has not evolved in any way spiritually in our sense of the word, who is not a master in the sense of our understanding of the great beings that have been dotted down through history like Jesus, but has enormous power and has managed successfully to maintain that position in the human race for a very long time now. And of course it intensified about 4,000 years ago as we move closer to the time of Abraham and all the rest of that history is there. But you know, if you look at the images of the being who's supposed to be God in the Old Testament, as we call it, or the Hebrew Bible. I mean, the amount of atrocities that are unashamedly attributed to this being uh, today, I mean, the, 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 the shock is not that it was ever said that he did these things, you know, the murdering of innocent women and children and the, the killing of every living thing in a city when the conquest was taking place in Canaan. I mean, the shock is not that these things were said, which you can probably tolerate a little bit more if you believe that they happened, uh, you know, uh, 3,000 years ago. But if you contemplate the fact that those things are still officially on the record, and by that I mean the record, I mean obviously the Bible. You go into any hotel or motel in the land, open your bedside locker, courtesy of the Gideons, you have still on the official book these atrocities that were allegedly perpetrated by a being who maintains that he is God. That is amazing. And it, it's, it's fundamentally uh, a, a good reason why we need to move from the Ptolemaic understanding of God and why we're here and where we're going and where we came from to a more Copernican-based view which understands that we came into existence because of an experiment a quarter million years ago and unfortunately our base experience at that time has imprinted our DNA ever since and as a result we have a situation, a crippling situation which I called uh, long ago as I mentioned the four great diseases of the mind. The mission of Jesus was basically to get rid of those things in us and to open us up because we do have an enormous ability and an enormous power within us. The only problem is that it's locked up, it's in chains and can never get out until we do something about it because tragically we have become our own jailer now for a very long time. The Anuna are gone. I know there are traces of them left still, but there were very good Anuna as well as very bad. And I think, you know, that they're not the catch-all. If we have any problem with our world today, we're inclined, if we're, you know, in, in enlightened enough to know all these things about our past, we're inclined to label everything uh, and to lay all blame at their door. Even the modern monetary system, for example, even the modern military system. Oh, it all goes back to the Anuna. No, it doesn't go back to the Anuna. Or if it does, I mean, it's our fault that it does because we have had a very, very long time now in which we could have addressed these things and have not so done. In fact, we have made them worse. So, Mihal, for those people that are visiting the stones and contemplating their origins and kind of coming full circle in terms of starting to wake up to something new, what, what is the path, what is the way, and what is the light for these people? Well, I think uh, an interesting thing happened uh, in our history. And as far as I can figure out, and this would take us too far afield to go into today, but as, as far as I can figure out, say from the time of Rathabin, which was about the same time as Jehovah, things improved between the humans and their masters, the Anuna. I'm using Anuna, not Anunnaki, because in their language apparently Anuna was their name and Ki was the name for this earth. So Anuna Ki means the Anuna who came here to this earth. There are other Anuna who never came here. 
So the correct name for, for the people is Anuna, not Anunnaki. But anyway, the, oh, that's a small point. All, all I'm saying is the things between the Anuna and their, their uh, product, the human race, who lived a very tragically short time, began around that time to change, from the time of uh, Jehovah, the time of Rathabin. And things were improving constantly down, that, down all of that period until about, as far as I can figure, 1900 BC. That's the bones of 4,000 years now. So around 1900 BC, maybe to 1950 BC, it looks like the Anuna left this earth. Now, the system that they had in place just immediately before their departure was that they used to put uh, hybrids, that is, a product of an Anuna parent and a human parent. Those were hybrids, and they usually put those into managerial positions and had been doing this for a very long time. Now, when the Anuna left this planet around 1900 BC, that system had really settled very, very uh, harmoniously into place. And there was an extremely good relationship between the Anuna and our own race. The hybrids were in charge of day-to-day -day, day -day managerial tasks. But when the Anuna departed, about, as I say, 1900, 1950 BC, somewhere there, the hybrids had to take over then. Now contemplate the difference between that situation and what was there previously. You had 10 major figures roughly among the Anuna in this most immediate period before they left. And they were regarded as the G-O-D-S. Not in our sense of gods as we think, you know, with God on a cloud there wearing a white nightshirt and all that stuff. That, not that kind of gods, but they were the gods. It's very hard for us to get our minds around how the peoples of those times actually thought of the gods. But they were uh, gods. And, you know, you could put your case to those ten gods personally. And you could hear their response and their judgment. And sometimes they... Uh, the whole thing got extraordinarily complex. My cat has just decided to take part in the discussion. Wonderful. So if you're losing, if you're losing the picture, you'll know what's happening. <laughs> but, Maybe um, the um, the cat people are arriving too. From... They, oh, uh, the hot horse are uh, in big time. I thought he was going to jump up on my lap here, and in which case, the, it would look like the cat was giving the talk, which probably might be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> your purposes. But anyway, oh lordy, he's jumping over onto my lamp now and the next thing he'll be on your screen. Don't, don't worry. Anyway, I, coming, get, getting back to the non-cat point here. Um, <laughs> when they went away, and now remember there were roughly 10 gods that people addressed their issues to uh, by, by about 1900 BC. When those gods and all their entourage went up in a vertical direction, what happened? Well, first of all, the hybrids took over. And after, say, 100, 150 years, fast forwarding this very rapidly, the hybrids uh, diverged into two groups. One group of the hybrids sort of evolved into taking charge of trying to keep contact with the Anuna who had departed. So they kept looking, well, we always looked up, for, you know, for something extraordinary anyway. We saw manifestations in the skies and so forth. But you looked up because that is the way the Anuna went when they left. So therefore, like, like we today, you know, if we say, oh my God, there's something or other, we're inclined to raise our eyes and look upwards. And we always pray to God up there and people in South Africa are praying to God in the opposite direction, which as I've said a multitude of times causes me some concern. Which of us is looking in the wrong direction? Is it the Southern Hemisphere or the North? I don't know. Anyway, the other group of the hybrids sort of specialized then in day-to-day -day affairs. And it does look very much like that most of the main ancient royal houses of Europe are linked back genetically 
to that race of the hybrids. So now we have two managerial groups. We have the, basically the religious group and we have the secular organizational group. But meanwhile, if, you're, if both of these groups, now we have a, a, an elite, we have a cadre of people whose work it is to contact the gods, which later became the religions. So now we have the, the kingly line and we have the religious line. And you know they tend to regard each other as sort of separate uh, entities. Like, for example, in England today, when uh, a, a monarch is crowned, it's crowned by whom? By the head of the Anglican Church because this is supposed to represent the power of God, anointing the secular authority. So the secular authority tended, tends and did tend in the old days in France and, and Spain and, and uh, all the old uh, European kingdoms, they regarded uh, the world as rule, ruled by two sets of authorities, the, the secular branch, who were the kings and queens, and the religious branch, which were whatever form the religious rulers took at particular times. Both of these descended from the Anuna. But the, the change that really came, which is what I'm primarily interested in here, is you had 10 gods, say roughly 1900 BC, the time uh, when you could contact the gods and get an answer directly was over. But they didn't know that. So the group that became the religious uh, experts they started hoping uh, and wishing and praying and beseeching the gods to return, which eventually led to what we call the second coming idea, which has been pinned on top of every major religious figure in the last uh, 3,500 years, especially to Jesus, as we know, the second coming of Christ. And we know Jesus is not coming back because once was much more than enough. I've said that so many times, but it's never enough to, enough to say it. But that, that's what happened. Now, the religious group uh, are, of hybrids are doing their best to get a response from the Anunnaki. And they're sending up prayers to the gods. But there's no answer. Nobody is answering the phone anymore. Nobody is returning emails anymore. In other words, the gods are, have become deaf, or at least they have become absent. That was very different, as I said, from the situation that obtained up to about 1900 BC, when you had these 10 individual gods who could hear your prayers, a sort of a Supreme Court idea. So what happens? Within 150 years after the departure of the Anuna, the number of gods on the books with the humans had increased to a total of 3,600 gods in 150 years. And the rest, as they say, is history. Why do gods multiply? Because nobody is answering the phone. Nobody is getting a response. So if I pray to God A, and then I don't get an answer, I turn to God B, and then to God C, and then to God D. But the trouble is that there's no answer at all. So over about another 100 and 150 years subsequent to that, we're now about three or 400 years after the departure of the Anunnaki. Now we have a priesthood beginning to emerge, which says that it's in charge of relationships between the gods and humanity. The only trouble is that the only uh, side that's responding is humanity and there's no response from the gods. But the priesthood claims that it is representing the gods. But there's no evidence that the gods are returning the favor because they don't ever seem to vindicate the fact or the claim that the priesthood is representing them. So the priesthood demands that the people accept that they are the ones who hold the franchise for God. And over the years, the human race gradually accommodated itself to accepting that because basically it was better to believe in something like that rather than the alternative, which was to believe that we had been abandoned entirely by the gods. So that is what has created this situation the fear of abandonment and 
the conviction that we are powerless and scattered in, in our efforts and in the focus of our will and intent. So fundamentally, the religious structure that has come from the Anuna then, or at least it wasn't put in place by the Anuna, but the structure that emerged after they had departed is one based on absence, based on unworthiness, based on guilt and fear. And those qualities were already there, as I said, in the four great diseases of the mind, the need for approval or the need for disapproval, the lack of self-knowledge of who I actually am and the tendency to blame, which was all rolled into one to produce number four, the religious mind. That was always there, but it really accelerated from about 1500 BC right down to our own time. Those, those same elements are still there. And it's, I suppose, no surprise that when Jesus came here fundamentally to teach us how to create reality in the quantum field, that was his mission. It's no surprise with all that weight of tradition rolling behind it about unworthiness and guilt and fear that his message was eventually, inevitably, interpreted in terms of that so that what resulted was a caricature of an incredibly wonderful person and an enormously powerful message. So Miho, I know that you have to go now um, and we're at 45 minutes of recording, but um, do you think it's possible for us to overcome the slavery mentality? Oh, it absolutely is. In fact, I, I, yeah, coming back to Carl Sagan's uh, quotation at the beginning that uh, annihilation is the rule and, and survival is, is the exception. I mean, I think we've got to do that now because otherwise the world is, is really in extremely bad shape. I mean, I, I'm not a prophet of doom here, but I think anyone that opens their eyes uh, has to see that we're heading for a brick wall. And the sooner that we slow down, turn, turn, turn on the brakes and do a U-turn, the better it is. And I think the fun, there, there's no use, you know, what did they say? There's no use to ticker, tickering and dickering with minor things. You know, we, we, need, we need to make a monumental change in central matters. And I think in, you know, when we look at obvious things like global warming, you know, there's a religion now about global warming and there are people who are agnostics about global warming and atheists about global warming and then there are believers about global warming. We have all these issues, the, the green issues and the other issues and the exploiters issues and the bankers issues and the people's issues and all that. You know, all of these things are fundamentally going back and pointing to a huge lack in how we understand ourselves. As I said, if we could manage to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and it's essential we start to do that right now. It's no longer an option. It's essential that we do this. If we begin to realize that we've been starting at the wrong end of things, and that if we really could clear our minds, which is an enormous task, I know, of all this unworthiness and guilt and hatred and envy and jealousy, and that is all draining away uh, the power that we have. I sometimes use the analogy of, you know, wanting to fill up your kitchen sink with water. Uh, the first step, it should seem obvious to anyone, is put the stopper, put the blooming stopper in the sink before you start pouring in the water. Otherwise, you're going to be in a race to see whether the faucet or the tap, what do you call it in South Africa, how much water that can pour into the sink and how wide the drain hole is that, that uh, drains it out. That's the kind of situation we are in today with so many of the spiritual movements and the mo movements that are trying to work with the environment and for the welfare of humanity. You know, all these magnificent efforts and even the more highly placed, uh, for want of a better word, efforts that we try to enhance our spiritual ability and power, it's all being drained away as fast as we create it. And where is it draining? It's draining away through fear, through unworthiness, through hatred, through jealousy, through antagonism and, and dissent. This is why Jesus said we've got to give up all these things. He said it because it was a fact of physics. It wasn't to make us nice people. 
In other words, this kind of attitude is draining away all our abilities. And I think uh, as a closing note on this, I have sometimes, you know, um, illustrated the teachings of Jesus as a half circle, 180 degrees. And the first half of it, which is where, where it was, the 90 degree mark is where it was cut out. He was stopped uh, 2,000 years ago. And where he had got to at that point was to say, look, we are all living in what we would nowadays call the quantum field. He used other terms for it. And the basic, the basic thing, I suppose, that we know about the quantum field is that nothing can come into my life unless I allow it there. In other words, we're all acting like magnets. If I am a nasty, you know, resentful person, I, w I am basically sending out magnetic rays to a nastiness and resentfulness to me. If I'm a loving person, I will attract loving things to me. If I'm fearful and so forth, I will probably attract situations that will vindicate my fear, such as having an awful car crash or something. So the message of Jesus was we're creating our own stuff. And if we could get ourselves to a situation where we come to grips with this, then all of those things that we do not want to have come into our lives, would stop coming into our lives. In other words, that's why uh, I used uh, the phrase earlier that fundamentally, I suppose, the bottom line way of understanding the message of Jesus is to see him doing his part to try to end the influence of these mental constructs we have inherited since our creation by the Anuna a quarter million years ago. So if, we live in a, if we're living in the quantum field and we realize that therefore everything that's in my life is there because I magnetized it, then the 90 degree mark would be to extend forgiveness and love to everyone or to put it in a more enlightened form, to not forgive people because actually there isn't anything to forgive. But to love and forgive was what he taught. That's as far as his mission got before it was stopped. Now the inevitable uh, implication is what happens after the 90 degree mark what's the next 90 degrees and that is a more difficult process than the first quarter of the circle was because now if I magnetized everything into my life that's there then I must be at fault even though nobody else is now I'm at fault so understanding how in a sense to forgive ourselves is the work of the second half of the circle and that's much more difficult because we find it much more hard to do that than to forgive others. But to realize once again that just as we really don't need to forgive others in so much as we need to recognize that there's nothing to forgive, that's the much better state. Likewise with ourselves, there's nothing to forgive myself for. It was just learning. It was just uh, searching. I grew wise and moved on. When we get to that 180 degree mark, we are now in a state of absolute power. Mm. I mean over myself. And therefore nothing else can ever come into my life to upset or disturb me unless I should so allow it. Whether it's unconsciously by my hidden attitudes and unresolved baggage or not, but basically it is I. And that is the ultimate answer to the whole problem of the Anuna. Instead of blaming the Anuna and their their successors, you know, in the religious realms or in the monarchical field. Why don't we realize that fundamentally the whole reason why this system has lasted so long is because we have allowed it to. And, uh, the, the, you know, the old saying goes, don't bother changing the world, change yourself. And if so, the world will fall into line very, very quickly. I think that's the basic lesson that we should have learned by now after the quarter million years of experience and after the gods went away and whether the gods return or the gods uh, do not return is really irrelevant because they are not God anyway, the creator. The creator is the one uh, ha, who, who St. Paul said in one of his better moments, it's who we live and move and have our being in. We are all sustained by the lowering of frequency from the creator. 
And we are embodiments of that creator 100%. We have an awesome power inside in us. And I think after a quarter million years, it's about time that we reclaimed it instead of blaming everyone in sight, which means like the Bourbons long ago, we learned nothing and we forgot nothing. So Mihal, do you think that ring of power that the hobbits are doing their journey to throw into the, the, the Mount Doom, do you think that's the power of, give, of basically giving our power away to other people that's, that's needing to be melted? Absolutely, down? absolutely. That is the heart of the matter, yes. And that We're we giving our forge power. Our, ourselves as kind yeah. of um, the gods as well. Yes, and you know, one thing I have after after many many years. Tomorrow is my birthday, but Happy after birthday. all, thank you. <laughs> but one thing I've learned after all these years. Someone said to me the other day, a friend of mine, that she was going to be seventy on the fourteenth of this month, and uh, she expected me to be very impressed. And I said, "Oh my, oh my God! I wish uh, I wish I were seventy again." I look back. To the happy days when I was 70. But anyway, I, my point is that after all these years of experience of all uh, varying, varied kinds, <clears throat> I now realize that, that that is the heart of the matter, that we've given our power away. And all of these methods we use, <coughs> excuse me, uh, protest, look, protesting. I mean, we know we have to protest, make our, our views felt, but you know what? There is another way to change things infinitely more powerful than ha you know hauling placards around the place and all that i'm not against hauling placards but i'm saying it's a very very hampered way of affecting meaningful change the only effective way of meaningful change without enmity without bloodshed without all these wars etc cetera, etc cetera, is to realize who we are as i said to get to that 180 degree point of absolute power i no longer have ever any threat to me again then i can for the first time be absolutely loving and absolutely caring to everyone why because nothing can impinge upon me unless i so allow it and on the positive side there is nothing impossible for me to do either when I get to that stage, we won't need to protest and we can save a lot of cardboard from the making of placards that never occurred. And we save a lot of shoe leather from the marching that never went on either. That may seem a bit uh, ironic, but it's real. In the quantum field, we know these things are possible. It's time we grew up and made sure that extinction is not inevitable and that survival is not inevitable either because we are not concerned just with survival we are concerned with living a life of abundance and joy and fulfillment and that is what was meant to occur on this earth let's start for for once to try to make it a reality and i'm so glad you're assembled at one of those really crucial sites for the origin of our race and I hope the most uh, wonderful thoughts and ideas will be sown there and will spread out to have a marvelous effect, not just on your own country and the countries around you, but uh, throughout the entire world. Well, thank you so much, Mihal. It's just such an honor to have you um, on the seminar. And I just imagine um, playing this in, in a few days time to the group and having all the orbs and various ghosts of the mountains in the future and in the past. <laughs> well, <free>. credo, <laughs> yeah, credo, credo mut for, I think he was uh, initiated at, at your site there where you're gathered. And uh, I know he was certainly of the view that there's enormous power and help of all kinds there. So maybe that will be a fertile ground into which to sow these wonderful ideas which you're having this week. And I wish you well. I only wish I could be there with you in reality. But this miracle will have to do for now. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you for coming from the ship of Tanaino to the ship of Adam's <laughs> calendar and planting new seeds for our new genesis for the future. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank and you my all. love to all... My love to all your participants. Thank you, and Take our care. love to you as well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.